Hello, Connie. Hello, everybody. My name is Amber Ragland. I'm the director of marketing here at the Reardon Clinic, and thank you all for being with us today. Uh, if you see the QR codes on your table in front of you, you'll be able to scan those and access the handout um, digitally as well. And we want to say thank you to Green Acres for sponsoring the lunch. And on the back page of the handout, there's a survey. So at the end, if you guys could please fill that out, and you can leave it on the table or hand it to a Reardon employee. Um, we just really want to add value um, to your wellness journey, and so your feedback will help us do that. And without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our guest, Jasmine Murphy, and our fearless leader and chief medical officer, Dr. Ron Huntinghockey. Thank you. And this will be a little bit different format as well, so we want it to be more um, interactive and personal. So we'll be taking pauses throughout the program to do a Q&A. So. Well, welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have you all here. Uh, yeah, we're going to, normally we would do a lecture, and at the end of the lecture, there would be an opportunity to ask questions. But today we're doing this special format because we are talking about intermittent fasting, but what about inspirational fasting? And what can be done in terms of stopping this rising tide of the metabolic syndrome? I don't know if you've heard of the metabolic syndrome, but it's where your blood pressure goes up, your weight goes up, uh, your blood, sh blood sugars go up, your the, your belt size goes up, um, and all of these things are now affecting, believe it or not, 70 to 80 percent of people in Western civilization. And so, uh, and at this point, there are some attempts pharmacologically to help people lose weight, but it's not really teaching people uh, a new way of life, a new way of living, uh, a, a method that would help them not only stem the tide of this, uh, this pandemic, this is actually a hidden pandemic. We know about the COVID pandemic. This, this actually made the COVID pandemic worse than probably what it might have otherwise been. So there's a number of factors that, that uh, contribute to metabolic health issues, metabolic disease. But we feel that, uh, that the intermittent fasting option is something that we're just beginning to learn about. Uh, it's been available for centuries. Fasting is not new, but the idea of doing intermittent fasting is something that has started to take hold, and, and I'll, I'll mention this during the presentation about the science of it. Mark Madsen just finished uh, in 2023 publishing a book about how this really does work. So. Normally, in the past, I would have my podium, and I would stand before you, and we'd have slides, scientific slides. Today, we are really fortunate uh, to have uh, our, our, our communications expert, Jasmine Murphy, to uh, basically tell us a story about how intermittent fasting saved her life and how it could save the life of, of many people. So uh, Jasmine tells her story in the, the podcast that we did on this. And the podcast turned out to be so compelling, we're going to show you essentially the podcast. And every seven minutes or so, we'll stop and take questions. So this will give you a chance to interact with us with your questions, your comments, anything that you would like to tell us about this. Before we start, though, how many of you have already dabbled with intermittent fasting? Yeah, so how many of you are having a, a, a positive response? Oops. A positive response to it. How many of you are somewhat disappointed that it's just not done what you thought it should do? Oh, OK, we've got a good, good perspective on that. And so, uh, Jasmine, do you have any, anything you, sh she's our communications director here. And so for people that are 
calling in to find out about us, they will talk with Jasmine and our other uh, team members. So any, anything before we get started? Um, just thank you for having me. I'm excited to be able to share my story, to have been able to share my story, and to um, answer any questions, and just to help people along their journey in fasting. I think that what you're doing and what we do is incredible, and so I'm happy to be here. Very good. All right, let me see if I can, Paul, I'm going to go ahead and see if this will work. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, you've all got this at your places. The, the podcast the transcript is at your place, so you can kind of follow along with what we're saying, and you can make notes, whatever you need, but this is, hopefully, will make this very interactive. This is the Real Health Podcast brought to you by Reardon Clinic. Our mission is to bring you the latest information and top experts in functional and integrative medicine to help you make informed decisions on your path to real health. Well, welcome everyone. It's Dr. Ron Henning Hockey, and we're back for another episode of the Real Health Podcast. And I'm excited today because we have one of our own employees, Jasmine Murphy, on. Jasmine, welcome to this show. Thank you. Thank you. So the title of this program is going to be, which will sound a little bit over dramatic, but it's not, How Intermittent Fasting Saved My Life or Your Life, right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you were just telling me a little bit about this, and just to kind of lead into this, at one point, you weighed 718 pounds. Yeah, that was my highest recorded weight. Highest recorded weight. And so how did that, and, and you really never did have diabetes. No. And you, and you didn't have any other serious, you had lymphedema. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that would go along with this, but none of the normal comorbidities, heart disease, and things, diabetes. you didn't have any of that? None of that. So let's just talk a little bit about how how this happened to you and uh, what were some of the, uh, the steps that led you to intermittent fasting? Sure, yeah. So, you know, I struggled with my weight all of my life. Um, some of it, I'm sure, is environmental. You know, some of it was, as time has gone on, found out that I had metabolic syndrome and some other things that played into that. Keep in mind that 70 to 80 percent of Americans now are dealing with metabolic syndrome, and a lot of them don't even know that they have that. But go ahead. Yeah. And it was a game changer when I found out mm -hmm. and what that meant for me. But, um, you know, very long story short, uh, I found myself, I was 25 years old. I was pregnant. I started to have um, the symptoms of lymphedema. I got put on bed rest, gained 100 pounds with my pregnancy. And like most women that find themselves in that position, you have the baby, you start to do the things that you need to do to try and lose the weight. And surprise, you're pregnant again. Mm. <laughs> and then life happens, you know. So um, I have my second child. I maintained my weight pretty well through that pregnancy. Oddly enough, she only wanted salad and fruit. So mm. I ate pretty well. But um, after I had her, you know, we had just life happen down to the economy, you know, about stress. stress, homelessness, you know, layoffs, all of that. And I found myself putting me and my health on the back burner. Everybody else came before me made a lot of decisions that weren't um, the most beneficial for me in my health. And I found myself one day outside. Um, I had fallen outside of my kid's school and I couldn't get up and I was over 718 pounds. Um, there was an older woman that saw and took pity on me and told me to take her place in line. And in that moment, I said to myself, I'm, I'm not living. I had just lost two people dear to me who I knew would have given their life to be back to raise their kids and to be with their family. And here I had none of the reasons to not be living, but I wasn't. So, you know, and, and really in everyone's story that is struggling with weight and there is a turning point. And you, would you say that was like the turning point? Oh, absolutely. I knew that day that something had to change. It wasn't fair to me. It wasn't fair to my children. It wasn't fair to the people that loved me, to the people that were in my life that had lost their lives. You know, I just. So you recognize the problem, but then there's always the question, what's the solution? So kind of let's talk a little bit about what was that journey back to 
where you uh, are, where you are today, where you're much more functional than you used to be. Absolutely. So I've always loved movement. It got really hard at a certain point. So I stopped, Um, you know, I was doing day to day things always. um, But I knew for me, the key was to start with the thing that I loved so that I could tackle the things that maybe we're a little more challenging with a little more ease. So I went to the dojo that my kids took karate um, at, and I spoke to the owner who I was, you know, pretty good friends with. My kids have been going there for years and I sat down at her desk and I said, I need help. Mm -hmm. I can't do this anymore. I need help. And so she developed a plan for me to start training with her son. I started training that week and, you know, it, it did not look like your typical workouts looked like. We had the fold up gym mats and he put them out and I sat on those and I would do punches and kicks sitting down and I would stand up for 30 seconds and do some leg movements and sit down for two minutes to recover. And, you know, what would have been a 30 minute workout would take an hour because I had to rest. My body just couldn't handle all of that movement um, gracefully, you know, with ease and without pain. But it was a starting point. Um, and you know, I really started to, to address this and tackle this, not as how do I get the weight off, but how do I continue to become stronger than I was the day before? I think that's a really good point because a lot of people, when they have a health problem, they're so focused on the problem that they can't uh, give their attention to the solution. Right. So kind of lead, how did this lead into intermittent fasting for you? Yeah. So my trainer at the time, he, he, loved to investigate and learn about new things. And he would always tell me, we, we found a kinship in that. And mm-hmm. so he would always bring me things and say, have you thought about this? Have you heard about this? And one of the things he brought to me was intermittent fasting. And he said, you know, he called me jazz and he said, jazz, I've, I've been reading, you know, on this intermittent fasting and here are some of the things that it does. And as he started to talk to me about some of the foundational principles of intermittent fasting, it made sense to me. It also felt good to me because one of my struggles with food was becoming hyper fixated on the diet. Mm -hmm. I never was a breakfast eater and every dietitian, every professional I went to would say, oh my gosh, you've got to eat breakfast and you need to eat six small meals a day. And you're, and that created a hyper fixation with food for me. And it made it I found myself overeating when I would do that because I'm so focused on now my natural inclination was to not eat in the morning was to drink. Yeah. Water. And it's important for people to know that inter- that intermittent fasting is not a diet. There's not a special diet associated with it. It's the timing of your meals and the uh, uh, giving your body a period of time where you go into natural ketosis. So at this point, we'd like to. Oops, at this point, we'd like to have your questions or your comments. Um, and so uh, we have a, the roving microphone. Thank you, Amber. And so, uh, did any of that resonate with you? Um, I picked up two things just listening to this again. For I've listened to it many times, but refocusing on a solution instead of just dwelling on the problem, you start to refocus on things that you can do and start in small steps and find us find support a support person or people or group or someone that you know that's going to help you turn the tide of your thinking because very, very often the the essence of any problem is our our misunderstanding of the root causes and so here at the Reardon Clinic we've always emphasized looking for the right root causes. And certainly, there's a number of factors that can go into it. We could talk, a, and we've, we, in, the, uh, in our lunch and lecture series, we've talked about environmental toxins. We've talked about stress, poor sleep, uh, dysfunctional relationships. All these things set the stage, but they can manifest as uh, unwanted weight gain and, and a sense of helplessness in that, in that, in that process. And so, any questions or comments? Here we go, right up here. Dr. Ron, ketosis, what's that word? Okay, we'll get into it. Uh, the ketogenic diet is another uh, 
approach to weight loss, uh, but it's a relatively difficult diet and it's another diet. I always say a di diet is a four-letter word and the, the, the research is pretty clear that most diets, it's hard for people to sustain it. But when you do intermittent fast for about 10 to 11 hours, which uh, we'll find, uh, towards the end here I'll talk about some strategies for how you can do that. After you burn off your muscle like uh, sugar, which is glycolysis, and, and uh, once you burn that sugar off, your body will go start using ketones. It'll produce ketones and you can live on ketones. One of the points that this Dr. Matson makes is that our ancestors did not eat three square meals a day. They would wake up, walk outside the cave, and there wouldn't necessarily be a refrigerator and a stove ready to you know, cook the eggs and whatnot. Uh, they had to go search for their food. They had to uh, move their bodies around, and they, did, they weren't able to eat. They also had to have sharper thinking and I'm going to tell you, for me, the, the real benefit has been that I, I do my intermittent fasting so that I, I don't eat until till lunch, but that has helped me to have better mental clarity in the morning time, which I, that's, for a lot of people, that's, it's hard for them to wake up or they're having difficulties uh, with their uh, job or whatever. Uh, so this is an, uh, what ketosis does is basically you're burning fat to get the ketones and the fat is crossing the blood-brain barrier better and you're thinking better and you're making better decisions. And the really interesting things that happens is you, you start losing hunger during that time. So hunger no longer becomes a, a distraction. Here's a question back. Yeah, so I started fasting with like a 10, 12 hour fast. It really was just let's stop eating sooner in the evening and then push back your first meal a little bit further. And so what I would do is I would stop eating at eight or nine. My kids were in karate and dance. We had a crazy schedule, so we're running late. But um, then I wouldn't eat until after my workout. Uh, I felt like I performed better during my workout. I didn't feel so sluggish if I hadn't eaten and I was working out first thing in the morning, so it just made natural sense. As Dr. Ron said, as I became acclimated to that, my hunger started to diminish and I was able to push that window back further and further. Um, I eventually got to the point to where I could do one meal a day or I could do 24 to, to 72 hour fasts. Um, but it was a natural progression that just kind of happened. I did not. Um, one of the things, and I'm sure Dr. Ron can talk about this a little bit more, but I was really focused on my protein intake and on the supplements and things that I was taking. I did not experience any hair loss. Yeah, for the yeah for the audience at home, do you lo do people lose hair? Certainly, if you were not doing it the correct way, you might lose some hair. Uh, but fasting, for the most part, can be very safe. Uh, but I think having some kind of coach is not a bad idea if you're going to do longer fasts. Did you have a coach? I did. I did. My trainer um, was very well versed in it, and he was a certified trainer. Uh, and we did a lot of research, and so he helped me in that process. Here's a question up here. Go ahead, ask your question, and we'll repeat it. Yes. And I'm not losing weight, but I'm not exercising. <laughs> but I have felt like I was sharper, a lot sharper. I have a little concern about my thyroid situation doing it this way. I'm just a little bit worried. My thyroid seems to be swollen a little more often than I, I kind of had it, my nodules under control, but now it seems to be swollen a little more. Yeah, so. So the concern that maybe intermittent fasting might exacerbate a health problem that you already have. Uh, I think if you start, you know, the, when, when intermittent fasting first came out, it was called the 5-2 plan. Two days a week, you would start uh, reducing the period of time that you would eat. Or, so 
the easiest way to begin for people that are just starting out is actually to stop eating after supper, <laughs> which is for some people hard to do. That can give you three or four hours of a, of a fasting period, and then you go to bed and you get another seven to eight hours of fasting period. You've already hit a 12-hour mark, and that's where they found that the body goes into ketosis, and, and that ketosis actually helps with the uh, formation of leptin. Leptin is where we feel satisfied. That's why fasting takes away the hunger. A lot of people say, I'm so, I'm so hungry, I can't do this. They're having hypoglycemia problems. And so as you ease into intermittent fasting, your body starts making leptin because you get over the leptin resistance. Your ghrelin is another hormone that starts to work better. The body starts to homeostase in a better way once you begin uh, fasting. And, but, but starting small is good. But I'll come back to your question. It's a good question like because I've been on this for a while. I don't seem to be losing any weight. What would be some of the roadblocks that, that, that pop up? Let's go ahead and continue. So, so what you're saying is you were able to take the fixation away from, I'm, I'm on a diet. So you, you, you were able to just focus on what the good parts of this were. So what were the good parts for you that, that helped you make this shift into intermittent fasting? You said, number one, that you never did like breakfast anyway. Yeah, no. I love breakfast food, mm -hmm. but I didn't like to eat at 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'm barely awake then, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Like, let's be honest. Um, my workouts were early in the morning. Ah. Uh, I would drop my kids off at school. The dojo was two minute drive from the kids school but my training was an hour and a half after I dropped them off so I would go sleep in my car until my trainer showed up. I wasn't trying to eat breakfast. Um, I'm hypoglycemic and I always felt like for me when I would eat and then I would you know at a certain point start to feel sluggish start to feel lower energy not higher energy I didn't want to work out after that. Mm -hmm. I started to learn that if I would go in in a fasted state drinking my water, drinking my black coffee, working out, that workout became so much more efficient and effective for me. Mm -hmm. um, again, it, and like I said, it removed the fixation away from food. It allowed me to, we talk about healthy lifestyle being about lifestyle. Like this isn't a short-term diet. It's got to be something that you can do for the rest of your life to maintain it. That felt feasible to me. I wasn't forcing a puzzle piece to fit. I was working with my body's natural rhythms, and it just felt so good. I noticed that my energy was better after my workouts. I could go stronger, faster, longer, harder, and I started to see an immediate change in my body, and even when I got sick, which we'll talk about later. But Yeah. Now, you mentioned hypoglycemia, so some people who hear and have heard about intermittent fasting, they say, well, I'm prone to hypoglycemia. Did you have to, in the process of uh, beginning the intermittent fasting program, did you have to start gradually or were you able to jump right into it? Um, we started somewhat gradually. Mm -hmm. We started gradually and implemented a lot of things that, you know, some people like staunch IF people are like, oh, that's kind of breaking your fast but it worked for me. Mm -hmm. So I started with, um, you know, making sure that I had the water with electrolytes in it. And um, right before my workout, I was drinking a black coffee. Some people say that breaks your fast. Some people say it doesn't. For me, it helped. It worked. Um, I learned how to break my fast in the best way possible for me and my body. Um, so like one of the things or the, the tips that we used was an hour and a, about an hour after my workout, I would break my fast with an apple and then wait another hour before I ate. Oh. And then I would have a protein meal. Mm -hmm. And that helped me, you know, to gradually come out of that. I eventually got to the point where I was able to do a dry, dry fast. I was able to do, you know, different fasting windows and do longer fasts and shorter fasts and mix it up. But yeah. So kind of giving the audience an idea, so what time would you normally have your supper the day before, and then what time, how, so how many hours would it be that you, you went through the fasting before you would eat in the early stages of it? 
So the early stages, my last meal was usually around 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Okay. And a lot of that was based on my kids' schedule. Right, right. <laughs> and I was breaking my fast at about 10 to 11 the following day. Okay, so you were getting about a 12 to 13-hour fast, which is not a bad way for people to get started, you know, right. because obviously intermittent fasting can go longer than that. And I did, did that happen to you? Did, to, did you start to lengthen out your fast period? I did. I naturally started to lengthen it. Mm -hmm. um, it just, there became a point where I could go longer and longer without feeling like I needed to eat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and initially there is that that internal fear that, oh, I'm hypoglycemic, I'm going to have to eat. My blood sugar is going to get really low. This is not going to be good for me. I noticed the exact opposite happened. And so then I was able to move into at my, without doing like the 24-hour fast or the dry fast, I was able to naturally move into a 24 fast. So 20 hours fasted, four-hour eating window. And that felt really good for me. Yeah. So uh, what period of time was that a couple months or was it it took about two and a half months two and a half to three months right right yeah. and so just for the sake of the audience you know there's going to be so much individual uh, molding of this program in order to make it work but I think one of the big things is is not to expect instantaneous results and maybe you'll there'll be some trial and error error in the process of it, but as time goes on, what you're saying is that it got easier and it started to feel more natural, yeah. which is uh, keep in mind that our ancestors did not eat three meals a day. You know, very often it depended upon what food they could hunt. It depended upon work schedules, uh, the f availability of food, and nowadays we've got food everywhere. And people, as soon as you say, I can't have this, then you want it. But interesting, and I'm, and I'm an intermittent faster myself, I've uh, lost five belt sizes in probably the last year or so since I've been doing it without a struggle at all. But what, uh, what was your experience as time went on? Did you feel like you had to work at this or did it just start to feel better and better? No, it, it started to feel better and better, and I started much like you said, so congratulations on the five belt sizes. Mm -hmm. I started to notice really drastic, rapid changes with ease. Um, you know, one of them actually was with my lymphedema and with the inflammation, the swelling. Yeah. Um, and then I was able to start to pay more attention to some of my body's natural rhythms, like... Um, when I would hit a plateau, how long that plateau would last. So now I can tell you. I know my body, and I can say, oh, okay, I haven't seen a change in two weeks. I know that in two and a half weeks, all of a sudden, there's going to be a quick change because that's how my body adapted to. So, it's so this is definitely not dieting. No. I always tell people diet is a four-letter word. Don't, don't go there. Okay, here's a question up here. Okay. You said you have one big meal a day, is that right? Yeah, I do sometimes then, utilize that method, yeah. Oh, do you have snacks and how many and how often? Uh, if I do a 24, split a 20 hour fast and a four hour eating window, then I will, I'll break it up and have maybe a snack, a big meal and a smaller snack. If I'm doing one meal a day, it is one meal. I don't snack on the other end of it, front or back. It is literally, I sit down, I have that meal, that's it for the day. And then you said you have a protein meal mm -hmm. uh, after the fast, is that right. right? Is that like a protein shake? Or do you have a meat, or what is your protein? Yeah, it's, a, it's just a higher protein meal, so it'll still be a balanced meal. I'll still have a healthy mix of you know carbohydrates and and my protein and my healthy fats, but it'll just be protein heavy to help with like my my sugar spikes. So you said the four hour eating window. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Yeah, so say that I break my fast at two in the afternoon and I'm going to eat from two to six. I would have, you know, a small meal at two, then I would wait until maybe three thirty, have a bigger meal. That would be, you know, more of a bulk of my meal. 
and then I would have a smaller snack right at about 5.30, closer to 6, and by 6 o'clock, I'm done. Yeah. I think we're so used to kind of like being done to uh, by a certain diet or by a certain technique. And the beauty of intermittent fasting is you are doing it, and as you go through the process, you learn how your body works best with this because there's many, many different ways to do intermittent fasting. The main idea, even if you did it twice a week, and for 12 hours to start with, or if, even if you start with just the three hours, four hours before bed, that becomes your fasting period. Then you begin to learn from that. You're, in a sense, relearning what has been ingrained into our heads, you know, three square meals, and you know, have a snack, because if you feel bad, you better have a snack. Now, in the early stages of it, you may need a snack. So there's nothing wrong with snacking with it. But the goal is to let your body have a period to where it can get into ketosis, back to ketosis again, because that's where kind of the magic starts to happen, because you lose your appetite, you feel better, you think better, you start to develop your own circadian cycle, what, what works the best for you. Uh, you. You actually kind of get an ownership for the process, as opposed to someone doing it for you. This is something you totally do on your own. No one forces you to do this. And it's the uh, improvisation that people go through as they're finding out what works best for them, which, whether a protein meal works or a salad, things like that. Everything that you know good about nutrition, yes, apply that. But there are so many variants as to what makes people feel good nutritionally. Uh, but make it whole foods, real foods, colorful foods, all the stuff that we talk about at the clinic here in terms of high quality foods. But give it some time and don't judge it too fast. I think the biggest mistake that I see is people will try it for a week or two and say, oh, this doesn't work. Another diet, didn't work. And they haven't really made the uh, insight that this is actually changing your way of life. Here's a couple of, yeah. She's, go ahead, Connie, would Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so I consider myself a dabbler, okay? Yes. And I don't diet anymore, I don't do that. But Jasmine mentioned coffee, so I wondered, you know, I've done it black, I've done it with oat milk, and bulletproof, so I'm wondering, do you, is there a preference well, any kind of carbohydrate is going to throw you out of the okay. fast. So, so you have to be, some people will do cream in their coffee because there's, no, there's very little carbohydrate there. And, and did you do that? I did not. I actually went all in. <laughs> and I wasn't a big coffee drinker before, but I went all in and I just started drinking black coffee. It was an acquired taste. It took me a moment. Um, but for that reason, I, I consistently heard that it would throw you out of the fasted state, and I said, okay, let me try it. Um, eventually, there were times, and like you said, this is one of the things that I love about it. There were times where I felt like my body needed something more, and so I would do a bulletproof coffee because I don't feel like with intermittent fasting, there's not a good or a bad or a right or a wrong. It really does give you the flexibility and the autonomy over your body and how you nourish your body through that process. So the days that I felt like I needed a little more, I would do that. But for the most part, black coffee. Okay, I have a second part real quick. The dabbling part, what does me in are snacks. So I can wait till one or two in the afternoon, I can eat a meal, but eight or nine o'clock. So I'm wondering, is that a function that it's just habit? No, it's, it's hypoglycemia. Very often, well, the reason we snack is because we start to feel shaky, nervous, and you don't know that you're hypoglycemic unless you wear you can now get devices where you can monitor your blood sugar but hypoglycemia is very common and it's not recognized as a factor by most doctors but after you work with this and, and again the key word here that I I had never thought of this but it's an improvisational learning process for you to find out what works for you and you, you can start real easy and gradually get better, like p playing the piano, you know, chopsticks. Start with chopsticks and then work your way up into Bronx. I just wonder about taking vitamins, taking supplements with water. Are the supplements likely to throw 
Typically, they don't. Typically, they don't. For some people, maybe yes, but there's not really calories in supplements. One more, one more question here. Amber. Right there, Amber. Right there. So my question was about supplements also. I'm taking many, many of them. And most of them are to be taken twice or three times a day with food. How do you work that into fasting? Because the supplement makers want you to take the supplements. They're good. And, but uh, some people have a sensitive stomach. And so they just go ahead and say, take with food because supplements are nutrients. That doesn't mean that you can't take it on an empty stomach. You can, but I think you'd have to see what your individual stomach, how it handles the different supplements. There may be some that you want to wait until you have your one of your two meals or your one meal. Then you would take your supplements with that. But it, it's not a requirement to take supplements with food. Okay, I think we'll go ahead again. We're going to get through this. Good questions. Thank you. This book that I don't know if they can, if it can be seen by the audience, but it's the Intermittent Fasting Revolution: The Science of Optimizing Health and Enhancing Performance. Dr. Mark Matson is one of the key researchers, and what he's basically saying now is that this is producing all kinds of really good health benefits, whereas we think of dieting as maybe uh, creating problems in people. And, uh, and it's not sustainable. I've most, there's, there, uh, there's just so many diets out there that are not sustainable. But part of the sustainability of this is that there are now, I can list 10 health benefits of intermittent fasting. And so I'm going to go ahead and list them one at a time, and you kind of give me your feedback. So the first one was in enhanced energy production. Did you notice that? Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And to not be a morning person and to work out in the morning, <laughs> to be able to have a really good workout. And I think I had my best results when I was working out in a fasted state. Yeah, that's great. Number two, cellular repair and regeneration. Did you notice that you uh, had a better sense of well-being and uh, that your body was starting to get healthy again? Yes. And Real quick, interesting story, and one of my turning points, especially in having conversations with friends and family that maybe weren't necessarily on board with the fasting, um, at a certain point, I had a bout with being septic. I septic. Had, yeah, mm -hmm. and so I was in the hospital, and I fasted. What most people don't realize, and I had to point this out, with me fasting, I was able to recover more quickly and I had to explain, you know, when you think about it, if you're in the hospital and you have a serious infection or illness, the first thing they do is they put you on NPO or no foods. No food. They put you on a saline IV to keep you hydrated, but you're in a fasted state. Yeah. And that's actually number nine of these uh, 10 health benefits, enhanced immune functioning. Fasting has been found to support immune system functioning by promoting the regeneration of immune cells and reducing overall inflammation in your body. So, 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 so that's amazing that that worked out as good as it did. Uh, of course, the big one is number three here, improved insulin sensitivity, because the essence of metabolic syndrome is loss of insulin sensitivity, or what's called it, it you, you go into a state of insulin resistance, and then the, the tendency is for the blood sugar to go up and for more and more insulin to be on board. Uh, now, you never did have a problem, though, with diabetes or, or elevated blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So yours was just a pure type of the probably relating to uh, the, uh, the lymphedema and probably stress. It just sounds like you were in a huge, huge state of stress and that that, that may be one of the major reasons why people get disruption of their metabolism. So, but a big part of stress is this feeling of loss of control. And I'm sensing that when you got into intermittent fasting, you started to regain control over a number of things in your life. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, it, it allowed me to control what felt good and natural to me, first of all, um, with my eating patterns. Um, you know, you, you spend so much time as a person on a larger body, having everybody tell you what you should and shouldn't do. So being able to do something that felt good for you 
um, that made sense for you was, it felt amazing. Um, the level of clarity that I had, like, it's hard to explain to somebody that hasn't fasted, but you have a moment where all of a sudden you see everything more clearly, things feel more clear. And when you have that moment, you're making better decisions overall. You feel like you're functioning in, in a higher state. That in and of itself gave me that feeling of having more control because I felt like I was able to make better decisions and not just with eating and with exercising, but just in life in general. Any more any questions or comments? I hope that's kind of resonating that, and I think this, you know, fasting is not new. That's probably one of the oldest things since it was, it was a survival technique. And in the world we live in, we need that. And so I think what, what was a problem with me is I looked upon fasting and hear about Jesus fasting 40 days and 40 nights. No, this is not that long. Uh, this is starting out with maybe three or four hours adding a fast period. Uh, this Dr. Wilson, or excuse me, Webster, in your health hunter that you have there, Dr. Webster is also an expert in intermittent fasting, and he strongly suggests starting, if, you don't, if you're new to this, just uh, when you finish supper, just drink water. Don't eat any, or any kind of calories or anything, and then go to bed, and then the next morning you'll wake up and boom, you've got 12 hour fast under your belt. Very easy to do, a little hard to break those snacking habits, but he recommends that as a good way to start, but there's so many different ways to start this. I has wondered what, how you test for the melabotic syndrome and what would cause it? Is it just the bad food you're eating or? So that's a lecture in and of itself. It's an excellent question. Is that uh, a blood test? But the blood test you wanna do, I think the best single test is a fasting insulin. If you really wanna find out whether or not you're in the metabolic syndrome, the one test would be a fasting insulin. You can also get the, uh, your belt size, you know, because it's basically putting on liver fat and visceral fat that causes this. And then your mitochondria dip, they don't work as well. And then you start having high triglycerides, blood sugar problems, hypertension, and you're at risk for cancer, heart disease, depression, sleep disorder. There's a, like, there's a whole array of consequences of the metabolic syndrome. That's why, to me, I mean, I've been here 35, going on 36 years, and I think the intermittent fasting may be one of the most powerful kind of like rediscoveries in terms of health that we could possibly, because it's, it's free. It just takes some understanding and careful work with it and don't give up. <laughs> and over time, you'll st it, at first it doesn't happen very fast, but once it starts to happen, you can start seeing that your sleep is better, your energy level's better, you're losing the weight, your numbers start looking better when you go to the doctor to get your levels checked. Stuff like that. How can somebody with that 700 pounds not have any kind of cholesterol or sugar problems when everybody's got diabetes and, and cholesterol problems anymore? Well, everyone's unique. So again, we, it's probably yeah. best, especially in, in this, not to generalize too much because each person's got a different biochemistry. But what, what would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, I echo what you said. And, and your question is a question that I was faced with every time I stepped into a medical professional's office. They would always almost presume, not ask, but say, okay, so you have diabetes. Okay, so you, what high blood pressure medicine are you on? And I would say, I'm, I don't have any. They would run my labs and they would say, oh, you look like a healthy 24-year-old on paper. If I didn't see the weight that we weighed you in at, or if I wasn't looking at you, I would have no idea. Now, we do know that there are certain markers that would have you know, indicated otherwise, aside from just my weight on the scale. But I think some of that also played into just my overall lifestyle. Even at 718 pounds, I was still as active as I possibly could be. I had two little kids and I was the primary caregiver. I was running them back and forth to school. I was taking stairs every day. I was doing all of the household things. So I look back now in my body now and I'm like, how did I do it? I did it, you know? And I think that some of that plays into it as well. So, but I do agree. I don't think that you should, it, it's 
so easy and common to pass judgment, especially just because of everything that we're told about what these things look like, but everybody is so unique and their circumstances are so unique. Even at 718 pounds, I didn't eat red meat. I was not a soda drinker. Like there were certain things that I did not participate in that I think helped. Dr. Rod, we had, we had a question um, from a viewer okay. online. What was the name of the book again that you had just The mentioned? Intermittent Fasting Revolution. Thank you. It's a 2023 book. Let's go ahead, we'll, we'll, this will be the last part of the talk. And there's a number of different ways to fast besides intermittent fasting, but one of the, one of the sentiments that's expressed in, in, in just about all the books I've ever read. Okay, here's a question. Okay, so you were talking about the cancer prevention, but what about, um, what about intermittent fasting while you're doing chemo? I've heard that this is very helpful not to eat when you want to throw up. I mean, you know. Yes, that's a kind of a whole other area. We have two uh, uh, naturopathic oncologists on our staff now, and they're very high on that, and it's very research driven. So even the conventional doctors are, are thinking about this. By the way, I have an intermittent fasting joke. So, <laughs> so this doctor was seeing the patient, going through his stuff, and uh, was, they finished up, and the doctor was going out the door, and without leaving any time for discussion, he says, and you need to lose about 50 pounds, and then he slams the door shut. And so he's walking down the hall and the patient peeks out and says, so do you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What, any other questions? We have a question online again. Um, does unsweet green tea count as water? <laughs> it's, it's a little better than water. I mean, green tea has a lot of good things in it. So yes, unsweet, but it should be unsweet. Yep, right. Okay. Um, do you find that the different fasting types might be better uh, depending upon your age group? You know, I think, again, that gets into a lot of individuality. I've seen some older people that are very fastidious and they can do it and have no problems with it. Then there would be other people that are, have a, may, they may be on a lot of medications. They may have a number of diagnoses that they're working on. They would need to go into it with a little more uh, supervision and not be too rapid at the uh, at the onset. Go slow. I have a problem with uh, <clears throat> sweet tooth, uh, chocolate in particular. So I'll snack with that uh, pretty much daily. Uh, I can do the intermittent fasting. I've done that, but then I'll still get into the the chocolate. So how do you diminish the sweet cravings? Okay. So did you have any you want to take that? Did you have <laughs> sure. Um, so I developed a sweet tooth challenge <laughs> myself. Um, one of the things that I did is I started to look at, one, the root cause of the craving. So with all cravings, and Dr. Ron can kind of speak to this some, um, usually they come with some type of like mineral deficiency or something else that your body is craving. That's it. But then also I started to look at, when you look at like the emotional side of those cravings, what can I do to make some swaps that might make it a little more beneficial to my goals while still allowing me to have that sensation? So like one of the first things that I did, I absolutely love cheesecake. I still have a very unhealthy obsession with cheese <laughs> that I work on daily. Um, and one of the things that I did is instead of a slice of cheesecake nightly, is I moved into having a cup of Greek yogurt and I would put some strawberries in it and crumble half of a piece of graham cracker. Is it cheesecake? Absolutely not. Did it still give me that sensation, the texture and a little bit of the flavor? It did. And so it allowed me to wean off of that habit that I had established for myself in a way that helped me reach my goals a little bit quicker. What, uh, what mineral is in high amounts in chocolate? Anyone know that answer? <laughs> Magnesium, probably one of the most important of all the minerals. So very likely there's a magnesium deficiency driving your addiction. Um, 
Dr. Ron, you talked about green tea with no sweetener. Is something like monk fruit all right? Oh, yes. Uh, monk fruit, uh, there's, what, there's about three of them. Honey. Yes. Honey? Honey gets a little bit tricky. I mean, if you're really wanting to do intermittent fasting, probably. Honey's got a lot of good things in it, but it's got a lot of sugar in it, too, and fructose. But um, I th monk fruit, I think, would be fine. Yeah. Monk fruit. Um, of those three sweeteners, monk fruit. Stevia. Not, stevia. Not really erythritol. Erythritol is a little bit iffy. Right. You know, I think, you know, this is where you want to kind of experiment around. Again, this is all a process of individualized search, finding out what works for you. I just wondered if you're going to be able to tell us which podcast this was so we can share it with other people. I just have to know it's 70. It's the last one that's on our website right now. If you go to reardonclinic.org and you go under education, it'll say Real Health Podcast. You click on it. It's number 70. And that's part of the reason we did it this way. I, I would encourage all of you to share this because there's a lot of people who have heard about intermittent fasting, but so many people have been defeated and depressed by diets and trying to lose weight. This is actually, think of it this way, it's not even a weight loss program. It's a health enhancement program. And as a side of benefit, weight loss can come, come off. And it'll be the right kind of weight. You, won't, you don't lose muscle in intermittent fasting. You lose visceral fat and liver fat which is the big problem with uh, the diseases that we're seeing these days. We have another uh, question online. Is it important to fast for seven days a week? No, it's not necessarily that. I, once again, improvisation, start with what works for you. Uh, as, as you get further into it, once again, it, it's something that you will become better at as you read about it, try different things, and, and it may end up seven. Do you fast seven days a week? I do. <laughs> so, so it could go that way. I, I probably only fast maybe four or five days a week. And, and there's good research that two days a week does a lot of good. There's a right over here. Yeah. Oh, I'm no, sorry. She, I saw a hand over here. Okay. There you go. So just some clarity on what breaks the fast. Um, you, you mentioned anything with carbs or calories or? Say it again. What, what, breaks? what breaks the fast? Oh, what breaks the fast. Really, just about any carbohydrate will break the fast. Because, any okay. because it's basically what's happened is that anyone that's dealing with metabolic syndrome has become carbohydrate addicted. And, and then as time goes on, the body kind of becomes numb to it. And so your, your insulin stops working. And so when you can start fasting, you, you, you start to uh, lower your sugar levels and your body's mechanisms for burning sugar starts to come back. Alzheimer's is the loss of the ability to burn sugar in your brain. And this is why this is especially good for someone who's concerned about that because ketones cross the blood-brain barrier and make the brain more active. Okay, and, and you mentioned one of the benefits is reducing inflammation in the body? Is yeah, that right? Yeah, that's all in this book. If you, this okay. is a pretty sciencey book, but nevertheless very readable. You'll find out these are not just speculations, they've done the research and it's working. Do you sell that We don't, we should, we, we probably will. All right, <laughs> Amazon. Yes. So do fats break a fast, like coconut oil, that kind no, of thing? No, fats do not break a fast. And so, but I would encourage you to use the correct oils. Coconut oil is a good one, uh, avocado oil, olive oil, and butter. Uh, organic butter would be great. But all the other ones, the omega-6 oils, uh, they, they go rancid way too easy and they cause oxidation problems. Yeah, um, Jasmine, as you were going, did you find your fasting method and just kind of stay with it, or did you kind of switch it up? What did you feel like worked better? 
Uh, I just listen to my body. So even with me fasting seven days a week, there are days that my fasting window isn't as big. Um, you know, I am still of the age that I still have hormonal shifts, you know, monthly. And so I listen to that. I listen to that with what I eat and how I eat it. So, yeah, I just, I really learned how to intuitively listen to my body and give it what it needs. Um, <clears throat> I've been fasting for cancer, and um, I understand that even when you consume just like on a carnivore diet, where you would not be consuming any carb, your body is still uh, producing glycogen. It, does that make your, see, it will still make your blood sugar grow, go up, is that not correct? Well, you know, your, your body is still going to run on some carbohydrates. You don't totally go zero into carbohydrates, but you start making ketones to fill the gap. But the net result is the glucose levels do go down, and that's the main thing that feeds cancer cells. The, uh, the, the scan that they do, the PET scan, where they inject radioactive tagged sugar, it goes to the cancer cells. They light up. So uh, when, you, when you reduce your sugar, you're starving the cancer, and you're also building up your immune system, your white blood cells, and all the things that need. Matter of fact, what's neat, you know, our metabolic approach to cancer here at the Reardon Clinic involves 10 metabolic terrains that we have our cancer patients pay attention to and start to uh, heal and make better. Uh, and so it, in a sense, Intermittent fasting does all 10 of those almost automatically. Not quite all 10, but a bunch of them. And so that's why I like intermittent fasting. You're accomplishing several things simultaneously with relative ease. The, like I say, the early days can be a little tough as you're feeling your way, finding your way. But once you start to get into a groove and you start reading about it and finding how much better you feel, it takes on a life of its own to where you don't have to struggle with it, unlike a diet. Also have some cancer that I'm treating with this uh, intermittent fasting, and I was wondering about flaxseed oil. Is that increased estrogen in a woman? Is that and I understand that cancer cells feed on estrogen. So that's one of the terrains that we're talking about is hormones, and th th there, again, there may be some increase with the. Black seed oil, I actually think flax seed is better because the flax oil can oxidize. But again, that's things that we would want to work out with a practitioner. Yeah, there's a question here, yeah. Um, so what is the best source of electrolytes? I'm struggling with Sea salt is one of the simplest ones. Uh, Himalayan sea salt is a good electrolyte, but there's a number of new products on the line yeah, staying hydrated with electrolytes is very important. And I think if you're doing intermittent fasting, it's even more important. So it's a good point. Because I get light-headed. I yeah. exercise about four hours in the morning. And I get light-headed because I don't have a good source. Yeah, we have electrolyte powders upstairs. Uh, there's a number of them on, on the market. But you need to use them. That's, that's the tricky thing. I've now got myself a jug that I keep uh, electrolyte water in it. And it, it makes a big difference. It's easier to stay hydrated that way. OK, any final words here? What would you say? I'll give you the last word. Um, you know, I just think I would reiterate that you know, intermittent fasting isn't a diet. It's a lifestyle. And I don't think that there are any hard and fast rules. Yes, there are guidelines. Yes, there are things that you want to pay attention to. But again, it really is about bringing your body back to center and listening to your body, honoring what your body needs and wants, and just having a little bit of grace with yourself because we all have ebbs and flows and days and emotions and all of the things, um, and that's completely normal. Um, I don't think that there's any good or bad to this. It doesn't have a moral compass. It just literally is listening to yourself, trusting yourself, and giving your body what it needs. Let's give a hand to Jasmine for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. You're, you're
<laughs> you bet. And uh, by all means, tell people about it because this same presentation is basically on our website. Thank you. Good job. Thank you.